courtesy of Rad, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Eastern Conference road trip is over and the Flames are on their bye week. And as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt here to break down, I guess, Matt, probably the quietest week for us so far, if you will. Only two games this week on the Eastern Conference swing. Yep. Um, Let's start, I guess, with the Toronto game. We talked about Montreal on the last show. The Calgary Flames played against the Montreal, or sorry, the Toronto Maple Leafs in Toronto and ended up eking out a 2-1 to one win in a shootout. David Riddick was in net in this one. Uh, the only regular time goal in the first 60 was from Derek Ryan, who scored in the second, and then William Nylander in the third for the Flames in regulation. Overall, what did you think of this one? Well, this was a loss that did not happen only due to David Riddick playing the single best game of his NHL career. You and I talked about, you know, minutes for the goalies last game and who's doing what and who should play what minutes and I think this is one of those games where Riddick knew he had to respond after not looking great and having Cam look great and I thought he did that right here yeah it, he made a number of 10 bell saves on various Toronto Maple Leafs especially Austin Matthews and Frankly, like this game could have easily been a five or six one Leafs victory, if not for Riddick standing on his head and even got a piece of the goal that they did score. So, you know, it's one of those when you get a goalie that's dialed in, you can have a game get stolen, and it, he, the rest of the team just did not look good at all, frankly. No, and we, I think we, you know, we were kind of expecting that in this one. I think it was probably partly a mental thing for the Flames of not probably coming in expecting to beat a Maple Leafs team that I think is built well this year, but I think also just and we probably saw it later in the week as well, run out of gas. Yeah. Their heads were on team, the break already, I thought. Yeah. And I think that a lot has not changed in this team from this time last year where uh, way too casual heading into the break and it just this whole last week and a bit has not been exactly good flames hockey no but it's what we've seen all season right it's kind of what we're expecting from these guys is we see a couple good ones then we go back to not so good like it's it's honestly kind of what you have to expect from these guys yeah, like you win five in a row, and then they put up. They did get two points in this one, but the last three games have all been terrible efforts by the Flames. Yeah, but I mean, if they were consistent, and we know they've got good players, but if they were consistent, you know, they wouldn't be where they're at. So, you know, I th- I think this is this is systematic of whatever it is this team's fighting this year. I wasn't happy to see it, but. You know, we're just not seeing the consistency we're expecting from, say, last year's Flames. And and I think it's, you know, it's kind of the story of the season at this point. Yeah, and it it's frustrating, but there's not much you can do. It's the, they'll figure it out one way or another. And it's just tough because, it's, you know, you have expectations of, oh, hey, you got back in the first, you know, let's step on the gas and then you know they just kind of waffle (laughs) along for a while and it's just frustrating to see in this game uh, Matthew Kachuk gets the shootout winner and I have to say when we went for a shootout against the Maple Leafs I was worried like even though David Riddick looked good in the first 60 of regulation I thought you know what the Leaves have some good shooters and anybody could score on them here and I, I was worried that it was going to be a loss yeah I was very surprised that Jason Spezza took the first shot for Toronto like I know he's a very good shootout guy generally throughout his career it's just it, that with the amount of talent that Toronto has like that does not seem like the best option that they could have thrown out there but Work to our advantage. Yeah, I was kind of surprised by that too. I don't know what the thinking was, but obviously their their coach wanted him in there for some reason. You never really see the media ask about shooto choices. Yeah, and that's that would have been one I would have asked about. Exactly, that's yeah. one where you're like, "Hey, why is this guy shooting? What's the deal here?" 
Yeah, it'd be like, oh, now shooting for Calgary, Milan Lucic. Um, okay, sure, you can do that, but why? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Or, you know, one of the defensemen. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's just when you've got that much firepower on your team, I don't know why you shoot uh, Jason Spezza that early in a shootout. Yeah. Like, if you're six or seven guys deep, then, hey, you know, who cares at that point? Throw something out there and see. Or even if you're on your third guy and, you know, you're first, like, yeah, I guess it maybe on your third guy you throw him out there. Yeah, just, it was weird all the way around. But, hey, it worked to our advantage, so it's all good. And then on Saturday, the Flames played their last game, game before the break in the nation's capital, an early start for this one. And the Flames end up losing 5-2. to two. But this is one of those games, and I think every team has one or two of them every year, where the score on the board probably doesn't reflect the play of the game. I don't know about you, but I thought the Flames controlled most of this game. Um, they didn't win a lot of face-offs, but I thought they controlled the tempo for most of it. And I don't think that they deserved a 5-2 loss. But what are your thoughts? Well, I think that the difference between the two teams is Ottawa didn't get a lot of opportunities but when they did they were in the high danger area and Calgary despite controlling the play and getting vastly more shots on net none of the chances were from in close and those are the types of shots where a decent goalie is going to stop them most of the time so it's one of those where the effort level by the Flames to actually get into the important areas wasn't there. And while they did out-talent the other team, it's all well and good that you controlled the play, but if you're not actually materializing that with any actual good chances, then it's kind of a waste. So I'm looking at where most of the Flames' chances came here. Um, most of the Flames' chances were sort of behind the hash marks right down the middle, which is pretty easy for the goalie to see. Yeah. The The Senators didn't shoot a lot of pucks from any one spot, but where they were the most was right in front of the, the crease. So, you know, that's where you can often get traffic and stuff like that up there. And and I think you're right. The Flames didn't have a lot of high danger chances. They did out I think they they looked like the better team for one of the first times this season for sure. Yeah. But I think maybe this is even the story of the season where they're just I don't want to say they're unlucky, but even when they're looking better, they're still struggling to pull off a win. It comes a lot to effort level and like willing to actually put yourself in harm's way to go into those high danger areas and you know pay the price because you are going to get whacked in that as you go into the slot but it seems that like this iteration of the flames just seems to not be doing the necessary things to get into the right areas in order to generate the chances that they need to You're do You're thinking they're looking kind of timid when it comes to physical play? Yeah, it, it, it everything's just a little too passive by the Flames. And that's fine, but, you know, you're going to... That's part of the reason why I feel that the Flames are able to turn things on, especially, like, with when they're down in the last five minutes because they actually go into those areas and they look good and that leaves everybody scratching their head of well why couldn't you do this the entire game but it, it's just frustrating because the talent level is there but getting that consistent effort level is missing frankly and I don't know about you but after watching Jeff Ward's system for the last like two months it seems like the flames are having a lot of issues with generating transition plays but i think that was even the case under under bill peters yeah but it's even more evident like it it seems that like the flames were able to generate some chances off the rush 
even earlier this season when they were struggling, and it seems like that has even regressed a bit, and, like, the Flames don't really have, like, the forechecking style players in order to play that, you know, type of game, and it just seems like this team is not on the right page in terms of how to actually generate offense properly. Yeah, and there's more to it than the transition. I mean, you know, you're right, transition, oh, for sure. transition game's part of it. I think, you know, zone entries in general have been an issue. Um, yeah. we're, we're seeing a lot of, and I've ranted about it in past seasons, but we're seeing a lot of times when they're looking for the right shot instead of just taking a shot. When they do take a shot, they're often missing the net. Like, I've seen some really great shots recently that, you know, went high on the glass. Like, there's, offensively, this team's just not clicking. Yeah, and uh, some of it is that, like, they do lack some forward depth, and, like, it would always be more awesome if they had another scorer or two. But they had pretty much the same forward depth last year and looked better. Yeah, and that's the key. And I think that, you know, like, of course it doesn't help that a guy like Michael Backlund has regressed into basically being a glorified fourth liner at this point and you know like some guys that you're expecting to perform at a high level aren't and that of course makes life a lot more difficult but you know like there's enough talent on this team where they should be playing at a far higher level than they are currently and it's it'll be interesting to see if they can right the ship without having to make a lot of modifications at the deadline and moving forward i want to come back to that michael backland idea um let's chat about just finishing off this week first we saw in this game i think well there wasn't probably a lot going right for the flames the big thing was the flames got a goal from a man who has yet to score a goal this year and that's Mark Jankowski is first of the year assisted by Backlund and Geo. You knew it had to come eventually, didn't you? Yeah. Well, like, this uh, team is... He needs to be better, frankly. And he has been more recently, and it's just been unlucky that he has not been able to score in a number of games more recently, but... It, hopefully that's going to change for him moving forward. So with those two games, the Flames now move into their, uh, I guess, week-long all-star break, bye week, whatever you want to call this. They're now sitting at sixth place in the Pacific Division and with 57 points. Or, or sorry, in the Western Conference, sixth place with 57 points and third in the Pacific Division. And that ties them with Edmonton for second. Actually, it's a, it's a quite a busy... I guess second place. You have Edmonton, Calgary, Vegas, and Arizona all at 57 points. Um, Edmonton second, Calgary third, Vegas is fourth, and Arizona is fifth, all with the same number of points. So it's going to be a, a tight race after this break. Yeah, and that's part of why the the Flames need to get off to a better method of playing it when they come back and you know, frankly, there hasn't really been any indication that they even have that in them at this point, but this team is very frustrating because, like, you can see at times glimpses of that higher level play, but it seems like each of the lines is missing parts that they need in order to be more successful. In some ways, and I was actually talking to a, a friend of mine this week, and he mentioned this. Tell me what you think. In some ways, it reminds me of the 04 lineup, where it was a bunch of spare parts that came together to really sink. And he said, you know, that's kind of what the Flames lineup looked like last year. And again, this year, being almost the same lineup, is it was just there were some good pieces like Lindholm, Kachuk, Goudreau. But then there's a lot of spare parts on the team. I'm not sure I would go quite as far as saying there's spare parts. I mean, we don't have the Simons and Oliwas and those kind of guys. But yeah. I, I kind of see your sentiment and his sentiment of, you know what, there, there definitely is a lack of depth here. Yeah, and, you know, to their credit, guys like Manjapane and Dubé have done 
a decent job as rookies, but, you know, they still, talent-wise, should not, at this point, be... Like, if you're playing a proper game, like, this, those two guys should be on your fourth line. Well, I mean, Manji Penny's been playing on the first line recently with Kachuk and Lindholm. Like, yeah, yeah. he's a good kid, but he's not a first-line right-winger. No, and that is why, like, the Flames, like, if they are going to have success this season, they're going to have to go and get a score or two. But it'll be interesting to see, because, like, this team, like, it's one of those weird situations where, like, everything to this point has basically gone wrong for the Calgary Flames, and yet they're basically one point out of first place in the division, and yet, like, two points out of being out of the playoffs entirely, and it's... And that's partly because I think, you know, it's always easy to look at our team and think the sky's fallen. I think they're not as bad as we think they are, but I also think that our division in general is just not good this year, and having such a close race, like we have four teams tied for 54 points, I don't think it's... I think there's a lot that's gone wrong for a lot of teams this year, and it's really not going to be, I think, the best team. But I think, honestly, going forward, it's going to be the... I think the most consistent team and the luckiest team. Yeah. And... Yeah, and it's going to be... I mean, if one team can pick up a 6-7 game streak, I think they're in. Yeah, and, like, you look at the standings. Like, Winnipeg, Nashville, and Chicago can easily move their way up and into the wild card spots effectively making it only a three team race in the west for our division and you know like uh winnipeg and chicago are both been coming on more recently and it if any of calgary vancouver edmonton vegas or arizona falter at all like they're they can easily get down to 11th or 12th in the standings and it's just very weird this year like it let me ask I've, you kind of a weird question and i we've sort of dealt with this before but um before i do we need to preface what the upside for the flames is this year do you think that the flames realistically make it past one round if they are playing in the manner that we have seen through 50 games i would be shocked if they won more than a game. We have no reason to think that's not the case. Yeah. Like, if they... Uh, that provided that the goalie doesn't stand on his head. Like, we saw that one year where Yaroslav Halak beat the Washington Capitals basically single-handedly. You know, and stuff like that can happen where a goalie can just take the series. So, for the sake but, of argument, you know, let's assume the Flames unless, would be out in yeah, the first. Like, uh, yeah, like assuming Talbot or Riddick do not go into god mode, you know, the Flames are likely going to be out in the first round. So let me ask you this then. As a Flames fan, as a, you know, media guy who follows this team on a different level, you can answer from either one of those or both. Would you rather the Flames push it, you know, from now till the end of the season and make it into the playoffs with the old adage that if you're in the dance, anything can happen? Or would you almost rather they don't make the playoffs and that gives them an excuse the deadline to start selling pieces because you're not going to sell if they're in the playoffs well the thing is is that to me like the end goal always is to win the stanley cup but but do you kind of say let's let's change it up and tweak it and go for the cup next year well this is where i'm heading with that is like i remember the boston burns uh, back a couple years ago uh, they got pilloried by everybody in the media when they traded milan lucic and dougie hamilton at the draft and like everybody's like oh well you're rebuilding in that and no they weren't they were they identified the key players in their team and their organization and they reinvested some of the parts that they didn't feel fit anymore into assets to help move them forward. And now they're back, you know, a couple of years later, they're back in the Stanley Cup finals again with a bunch of new people in their organization. Uh, and if they had drafted better, they would have gotten a number of good players that 
went immediately after <laughs> when they selected, but um, I think that the Flames are in a weird position where I almost want them to take the bold move of saying, hey, yeah, we can make the playoffs and we might win a round. You know, like if the Flames met up against Vancouver in the first round, the Flames probably beat Vancouver. But, you know, like... The, I, I guess what I'm trying the, to say is even if they're out in the second know, round, is it worth not no. capitalizing on assets like Brody, Hamannick, to try and win a couple rounds when in the end we know we're not going all the way? Or do you... Sell what you've got. If you still make the playoffs, great. But do you approach the deadline at this point as a seller? Yeah, I would. Definitely, 100%. I, I just think it would be foolish at this point to say, let's hold on to Brody and Hamannick in case we can go for a run. Well, we can't even win. I mean, we can barely string three wins together. Yeah, and at this point, with how this team is operating, where things just aren't working as they should be, in very much the same way that the Boston Bruins, they were having the same problem where, like, it, the mix just wasn't clicking for them. Sometimes you need to just move on from certain players and just get a new body in there in hopes that you find the right pieces to eventually fit. And the Flames have a good nucleus of very young players. Like, the defense core is set for a long time with Anderson, Hannafin, Valimaki, and Shillington. The last of which, Shillington, has played exceptional recently, and I just want to give him a thumbs up for that. But, you know, like, and the forward group of Kachuk, Monaghan, Gaudreau, and uh, Lindholm, that's a good group. You have Peltier, Dubé, and a handful of others that are doing well. Like, this team has a lot of good parts, but they could use a lot more assets in terms of young players coming up. And in terms of, like, what's on Stockton, well, you have Glenn Gaudin, who, okay, yeah, if he develops into an NHL player, he's not going to be really much more than a fourth-line guy. I think Godin's in your Dubé, Mangiapane like range of you know what a good useful piece, but not a guy you're going to build this franchise around. No, it, a good depth, it, basically Josh Juris or some equivalent guy. Where okay, yeah, he might play for a year or two for you, be okay, and then on to the next guy. And I don't want to overvalue and, our assets, but I don't know when the next time we're going to have assets like Brody and Hamonic to sell are. Yeah, I Even know, Talbot. and especially. I know, and like if you look at the trade deadline, what's the thing that always goes for the most amount? Defenseman, because everybody needs a defenseman. Defense and goalie. Yeah, and you can get a first for Brody. You can get a first for Hamannick. You probably each of those plus something. And to me, like yeah, it would suck, you know. And like the flame is probably miss the playoffs but at this rate i think they miss the playoffs anyway well that's what i'm saying I, I don't i don't want to go out like you say we need another forward and we do but i don't want to go out give up a bunch of assets for some forward we've got for you know two months and we go, ah, damn okay we gave up assets didn't work see ya yeah well uh and that's this is one of the things that canadian teams like that there's a reason why the last time a canadian team won the stanley cup was in 93 and it's any time any of the Canadian teams have gotten to a point where they're in pushing to be an actual contender, they trip themselves up doing stupid things. And in the Flames case, like we had the run in 04, which was completely unexpected. And then we gave away half of our good young players and then didn't like just build from there and instead oh let's get a bunch of veteran g scorer guys which didn't really fit and like the team just waffled and wasted the entire time and you've seen that with teams like vancouver edmonton toronto like it, they just kind of step in their own way like even look at the toronto signing john tavares that was not a necessary acquisition, and, you know, like, Tavares is a great player, 
But when you already have so much money tied up in other homegrown guys, like, it, they've kind of shot themselves in the foot in terms of being able to have sustainable success. Yeah, I mean, I, and, and again, I don't want to overvalue Brody and Hamannick, but you'll get a decent no. return, whether it's draft picks, whether it's a young player, whether it's a hockey deal like, let's say, the, uh, the Lucic deal where you're trading, you know, a defenseman for a forward of similar money. But I think right now the wor- this team's not going to go out and, and get a rental. They're smarter than that. But I think the worst thing they could do right now is hold assets for the playoffs and then we lose them for nothing. Yeah. I and don't think you got to go out and trade 13 or you know some of your star guys that are under long-term no. deals yet. I think but- that, yeah, I, I think that would be foolhardy to sell off the core guys. And like with Boston previously, the only guys that they – traded of note were Lucic and Dougie Hamilton. Like, they kept Bergeron, they kept Pasternak, they kept Marchand, and, like, all the other core guys, and they just filtered some pieces out and brought a bunch of younger guys in, and, you know, they're, I think, what, second in the NHL right now behind Washington, and they were in the Stanley Cup last year and are probably the favorite to in the east to go back and calgary if you can play things correctly by shifting money around uh you know like shedding uh brody and hammonick's money it you know anderson and shillington are going to need more playing time moving forward i'm waiting for you to say taylor hall no no i'm not going to go there you know and uh, hey, that would be awesome, but, you know, like, there are other ways of going about it. There are a bunch of UFA guys or tradable forwards that are in that similar five-ish million dollar We talked range. about that last week. We won't get back into those names. Yeah, but, you know, like, you can re... Like, infuse some of your lineup with youthful players... And reinvest the cash, like Backlund's contract, if you can trade him. And reinvest that money into other assets and, you know, promote guys like Dubé and Manjapane into full-time duty. And I think anybody on a long-term through. deal like Backlund would be a draft move. Yeah, I, I could see that. Uh, it, it would depend on, like, what you get, frankly. Because, like, there's always a need for centers and defensively reliable guys. And I think that like, even though he's a multi-year remaining guy, I think a lot of teams would still be interested in Backlund just because of his excellent two-way play. But if you move Brody and Hamannick out, and I don't think they'll move both. I think they'll sign one, move the other. I honestly think they're going to sign Hamannick, move Brody, but let's assume you move one or both. I think then you get a spot to test out Anderson and or Shillington, depending on how many of them you move, in a top four defensive role. And, you know, I, I think, again, if we're not looking at these guys as, well, they're not good enough to win the cup there, which they're not. But I think if you can give them two months in that role, you can really see what have we got in these assets. Yeah, and that way you can understand of like, oh, crap, we need to go get another good defenseman in the off season and sometimes young guys rise to the occasion sometimes they don't i don't think shillington would rise to the occasion every night but i think it could be good for anderson's development yeah and i think that eventually shillington will be a good top four defenseman but with him it's gonna take a while still and he's getting better like the last few weeks he's played fairly good frankly and is deserving more than third line minutes but It'll be interesting to see, and, like, the Flames don't really have any young defensemen coming up through the system, um, other than, uh, Yellison, and so, Valimaki, when he returns from injury, like, that's basically it, and that, this is part of, like, why the Flames, I feel, would do themselves a lot of good to just sell even if they you know if they make the playoffs still hey great awesome but you know i like i I think that with all of the weird wacky stuff that has gone on with this team and like how 
everything just seems to be going kind of sideways with this team where like the good players aren't really playing well and everything's kind of disjointed that like this is the time when I think it would be most advantageous to do a if you're gonna hit like a reset button without blowing the whole team up I think this would be the best time to do it because of the fact that you have enough sellable assets without like trading any core pieces yeah, I mean, to me, if I look at the guys that might be, and we'll talk more about the deadline as we get close to it, but if you look at the guys that might get you a decent return, I think it's Brody, Hammonick, Talbot at this point, guys that are on expiring deals. Yeah, and Backlund. I'll throw him in there, too, because, you know. But... Yeah, well, I mean, if we look at non-expiring, you could put Backlund in there, you could put Bennett in there, like, you know, you really yeah. open the field then. But if we just look at the expiring piece, like, you're not getting anything for Reader who's on an expiring contract. Yeah, him, you might get it like a fifth. Well, that, at which, that point, you might it, you as well know, just hang on to him. Everyone's got a Tobias yeah. Reader. Yeah. Well, if somebody wanted him and, you know, you're selling everything else, then, hey, sure, call, uh, you know, one of the kids up from the farm at that point, and who cares? So like, throw Klein out there instead. So know, I like think it'll a, be, you know, I think by the, I don't even think you can wait for the deadline, but I think a week or two for the deadline, you've got to decide, has this team change things up can they be more consistent if not again we're not saying they're not going to go to the playoffs but i i think you're you pretty much have to say is it worth selling assets and hoping for the best and you know what we can always as you mentioned and we mentioned last week buy some ufas and make some trades in the off season and retool there but i think now is the time to be able to acquire some futures for cheap yeah and it's a because of this season being so weird in that like in our conference the only teams that are really out are san jose anaheim and los angeles and in the east it's only ottawa new jersey and uh detroit like there's and none of those teams other than san jose have a ton of sellable assets that you know like <sighs> Calgary could make out like bandits. Like, they're... Like San Lots Jose of buyers not, and few sellers. Yeah, like, there's no real good, high-quality defenseman on the market from any of the teams. So, you know, like, TJ Brody and uh, Travis Hamnick would instantly be the most sellable assets probably in the league. You know, and you have a whole bunch of teams that are looking to acquire defensemen for a run well you know you're gonna get a lot for those guys and like this draft is not a bad one you know and the flames have shown a very good aptitude for their picks recently with a lot of their selections looking to be better than average for the rounds that they are selected in and uh, it, it'll be interesting to see. Like, if they can go in with a few more bullets in the chamber, like, you know, they're more likely to end up hitting on the target with a bunch of players instead of, you know... Th like, this team really does need a little bit more speed and ability throughout the lineup and... And yeah, a draft like pick it. also becomes currency. If we let's say that we end up with three first rounders, doesn't mean we select three first picks. I mean, no. you could easily take one of those first round picks to the draft floor, trade it and Backland for somebody else. It just gives you a lot. More. I mean, look at what we've been able to parlay picks into in the past. Like it just gives you more currency. Yeah. Well, like if you look at uh, for rounds one through three, right? For the last since twenty fifteen. Uh, Rasmus Anderson, Oliver Shillington were in 2015, both hit the mark. Uh, Kachuk, Dubé, Fox, and Parsons in 2016. Parsons is the only one who's wavered, but Dubé is in the NHL. Kachuk was a home run, and uh, Adam Fox is looking dynamic. In 2017, Valimaki, and he's in the NHL and will continue to be. And both Peltier and Nikolaev this past year have are looking good thus far. So, you know, like, when this team over the last number of years since Treliving took over the draft, if they're in the top three rounds, 
the Flames are pretty much hitting a bullseye every time. And, it, you know, that's why, like, I'm more comfortable and would be more looking forward to it if this team were to sell at this deadline and get more of those, like, top 90 picks just because of the fact that they're going to have, with their track record of success when selecting amongst the good players in the draft, they're seeming to be hitting the mark quite frequently, and that would be very good for this team moving forward. Do you ever watch the deals on draft day and look at what some team got and said, wow, I wish we could have got that return for that guy? Yeah, same here. I think this is the year that we can, we have, I mean, the last time I remember the Flames had a big guy they might have been able to move the deadline was the, the year that they didn't move Camilleri. Yeah. And this is the year we've got the ammo to do it, and I don't want to say you're crappy enough to do it, but we've got the ammo to do it, and it's probably not going to affect the end result all that much. Like, it's just a perfect storm for, for moving on from those players, and you know, I could totally see them do something with Hamnick like they did with Ole Jokinen. You remember they traded him at the deadline and then brought him back July 1? I could see that happen with a guy like Hamnick. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, like, there are a number of guys that you could do that with. It's just, to me, like, I, I view that it's better for this team just to get as many assets possible, it, it, especially, like... We were both there in July at the development camp, and like, other than Dustin Wolf and Peltier, like the, the, there were some guys that were all right, but like it was there wasn't a lot of development sparse. happening. Yeah, it was very sparse. And well, that's like, been that the was, case for the last few years, right? Is they've had just augment it with bodies because they haven't had a lot of of bodies. Yeah, and like that's where. You know, like, this is a perfect opportunity to replenish some of that that's been missing. Like, I remember a few years ago when, when Fox, Shillington, and Anderson were uh, headlining the Defense Corps during the development camps. And, like, you could tell that each one of those guys was going to be an NHL player based on how they were playing. Since then, like, Valimaki, of course, but, like, not... There, none of the guys on the defensive end looked very good. Even with how hurt Valimaki's been since he turned pro, I'm not sure he's going to turn into the pro we think he is. We'll see. I'm hopeful that he, you know, just having issues right now and, you know, a little bit of Sammy Sallow, you know, syndrome early in his career and then like, once things return to normal, he's fine, but we'll see. You well, know. well, let's talk more about the deadline when we get to February. How does that sound to you, Matt? Yeah. Um, well, and that's, again, like, what I've been harping on is that, like, this team, like, we're this many weeks out and still not really sure what this team is, and I think that that's continuing even now. Well, even in past years when we've said, you know what, this team can't sell, often it was because we had no asset to sell. Like, selling would have meant Goudreau or Monaghan or a big piece of this team, Giordano. And, you know, I think, like I said, this is the first year we can afford to sell and not lose our core. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. And, yeah, it'll be interesting to see exactly, you know, because this is just a... To me, like, this right now is the perfect time for, like, any team that would be in this situation, They, I'd be saying, oh, they should, you know, make some tweaks. Like, you look at Columbus. I think that's what it would be. It'd, it'd be. it'd be big tweaks, but it'd be tweaks. Yeah, because, like, you look at Columbus, and they lost their two of their leading players uh, with Panarin and uh, Duchesne, and Bobrovsky left. And... Oh, well, they're going to suck, obviously. Except that they're doing better than all of the teams that were those players went to and are pushing for a playoff spot. Well, that's where I feel like this team is, is that like even though like this team is currently waffling, I think if you can switch up a bunch of things and you know, get a different chemistry going that that might be enough to power this team moving forward. 
and like Columbus, they didn't really skip a beat even though they lost three really impressive players. And I think that the Flames, similarly, like if they traded off Backlund, Tamanek, uh, Brody, and Talbot, like would we really miss them next year? Not, I don't really think so. I think you can replace those three pieces either That's, internally or on UFA day. Yeah, I agree. And that's where you know like at the end of the day are you really going to be like are they crippling moves not really you know like anderson and shillington can probably use more minutes valimaki is a bit of a wild card you know like you'd you'll need some time for valimaki and i'm sure that you know if you move shillington up into the second pairing and through valimaki in the third pairing that you know, you'd have enough playing time for everybody. You know, I would even say at this point, keep Valimaki down in Stockton. We'll get a lot of minutes and bring Davidson Oh, I up. know. No, I'm meaning like for next oh, year, okay. not not right now. But, you know, like have it where like your lineup is more spread out and like you're not really going to skip much of a beat, at, I think, at this point by swapping out those pieces. And it'll be interesting to see how this team moves forward but when you know. we, when we look at this team and where it is and how it's made up there was a discussion this week on twitter on the sort of flames twitter verse about did true living do enough in the summer with what he had and what he could do and um you know did i guess essentially did he hamper the flames by not doing enough and just wanted to recap because i know summer was a long time ago especially as we're getting out of this minus 30 week we've been in it doesn't feel like summer, but just remembering some of the key points. Kachuk's deal dragged on. I remember you and I kept being like, it's going to happen, it's going to happen, and it kept dragging on. There was apparently a trade for Kadri that fell through. Valimaki had his knee issues. Like I think they were counting on him to be an NHL player this year. We had salary cap challenges. So with all those things in mind, Matt, could Tree have done much more than he did? Well, it- When it comes to trades, it takes two to tango, and, like, ideally, yeah, we would have seen the Kadri trade, but, you know, that fell through. This isn't like on Xbox where you can hit, you know, force trade. Yeah. Let's go harass the next team with the same offer, and, oh, they'll be sure to pounce on it. Well, and I think nobody was wanting to make trades because everyone was uncertain of their cap. Yeah, and... uh, Everybody was just kind of, well, I don't know what to do. Because, you know, you have zero dollars to work with. It kind of becomes difficult to make franchise-altering trades. And I think that you're seeing a bit of that chaos in the standings where everybody's kind of in that middle ground where everybody could either win their division or be like eight points out of a playoff spot, you know, and we're at game 50. Yeah, you know, and like all the teams seem to have various holes that they would have normally addressed had they had more cap space, but you know, they weren't able to do things normally and Tree was caught in that situation where everything just was a bit weird and to me it's not like we saw any GM go out there do a bunch and we looked and said, Well, why didn't Tree do that? Like yeah, no. yeah, some trades got made, Kadri got moved, that sort of thing. But hey, we made a trade too. We made the Neil for Lucic deal. And I, I really think the tree did the best he could, all things considered. Yeah. And despite James Neal having nearly twenty goals, I still would rather have Milan Lucic on the team. From what I've seen of Luch in the room, from the exposure I've had in there after the games, he fits so much better on this team than James did. Yeah. And honestly, I'm not convinced that that was... I mean, you know, we've even seen Cassian play on the top line in Edmonton and get a lot of points. Like, we could put you on that line and you'd get points. I, yeah. I don't think it's necessary uh, like, that as James As long as Neal you have a pulse and there. can stand on your skates, I think that you'd get some points. You know that kid who skates around on the Flames game with the flag? You could put him out, out there and he'd probably get a goal. Yeah. Like, come on. When you're playing with... Like, there are only a few guys that are just that good, and McDavid is one of them. That, yeah, you, you could... It, it's just like uh, when uh, Rob Brown played for Pittsburgh and scored, I think, 40 goals that one year. 
because, oh, he has Mario Lemieux feeding him the puck all the time. Well, or like Bernie Nichols scoring 70 goals one season because, you know, Gretzky was, here you go. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, even those... to a lesser extent, I think Craig Connor is made to look better than he was when he played with Jerome. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Like, Conroy, as much as we like him, was not a... He's a solid third-liner. Yeah. He, he's not a first-line center on any, you know, like, unless you're a rebuilding team. I and, would argue Jelena yeah. wasn't either. No. Like, they were both high-end, second, third-line types, not, you know, prime guys. But, hey, when you have one of the best goal scorers in NHL history, you're going to get some feed off of that well let's move in a bit of a different direction then um talking about what tree did in the summer and maybe you know guys he did or didn't bring in we saw one big move probably the biggest move for the flames this year and the thing this season we remembered for i think in the history books 40th year of the calgary flames and we fired our coach we fired uh bill peters as we know jeff ward is the interim coach here we'll debate as we get closer to the end of the the year if he should get a full-time job or not but if we look at the coaches so far that are without a job in Babcock, Hines, Montgomery well I guess Hines got re-signed so Babcock, Montgomery, Laviolette and Gallant um, do you if you were hiring would you look at bringing any of those guys in next year do you think they're better options than Jeff Ward? Honestly I would be looking at Gerard Gallant and Peter Laviolette right now you think in like during the your third break, your third coach this season? Yes. Why not? Go for it. You know, like both of those both Gallant and Laviolette to me are top five coaches in the league and have shown the ability to get the most out of their teams for each of the locations that they've played at and Do we know if Gallant got left outside the bus again? Well, I think he got his own taxi this time. Well, that's classic. And you know, being it, being in Vegas, you don't really have that difficult of a challenge of getting a taxi. But yeah, um, I, I'm I'm not a huge fan of Laviolette. I'd be willing to try uh, Gallant. I don't. Uh, you know, I actually agree with you. I don't like Laviolette. Uh, you know, from appearance on a personal level. But a lot of his teams end up going to the Stanley Cup Finals. But I wonder if that's just a a coach going to a good team. Like there's some years I look at teams and go, I could coach this team. My my grandmother could coach this team and they'd still do well. Like I don't know how much he's helping the team. Yeah. Well, it's one of those where I think it's a little bit of A and a little bit of B. And you know, I mean, you look at the mid two thousands Pittsburgh Penguins. I mean, you could probably, you know, my grandmother could stand behind the bench and yell at guys, and they would have done just as well with or without her. Yeah. Oh yeah. Or like mind the your early stick, 90- Sonny. Yeah. Or like the early nineties Penguins or the Detroit Red Wings. Like you know, you could have anybody. You know, cardboard cutout, and they do just as good. Um, but, no, yeah. I mean, if we look at sort of the interim coaches as well who might be available, you've got really, I think, uh, Elaine Nasser, Nasser Day or whatever his name is in Devil in New Jersey isn't going to be a, a guy that becomes a head coach. But Bob Bugner is also a interim coach right now. I would take a look in the offseason of Bugner as well. Yeah, uh, he wouldn't be bad. Um to me, though, I think that, like, because Rick of Bonas the fact that Rick is not a guy you want to look at. Yeah. Because they're available right now, uh, I would be going hard after either Gallant or LaViolette. And, like, if the Flames hired either, I'd be like, hey, great, awesome. Just to, I yeah. guess, save face for Jeff Ward, um, would you then move Ward back to to um, associate coach or would you bring Gallant or Laviolette in as associate coach and let Ward finish out the year and then just swap into head coach in the offseason? No, I'd uh, I'd have Ward uh, basically be demoted back to being the associate coach. And it's not that Ward's done... Like, the team has played better in terms of the results, but... 
how the team is playing on the ice, I think the results themselves are not indicative of how they're playing. And, like, to me, like, when I've been watching them play, like, even though, like, since New Year's, when they won their five games in a row, frankly, they were only the better team in, I think, two of them. And even during that seven-game win streak last month, like, they weren't awesome during the streak. And, like, I ha I haven't really seen this team getting on the same page where, like, you when you see a team winning, like, six, seven, eight games in a row, like, everything's clicking. And I think that, like, they went on a run even though, like, things weren't working properly. And you know, like, the last three games being more indicative of how they're actually playing, where they got shut out, only scored one on a redirect, and then got blown out. And, like, I think that this team... I think needs a better, more established coach. And, like, that that's not to say anything about what Ward's done as an associate coach. I've actually liked his, like, ever since he came here. It's just that... I think that if you can upgrade that with a Laviolette or a Gallant, you have to do it. And because those are two of the best coaches in the NHL, and they're both available, and you're missing a head coach right now. When I look at the Flames and guys they've brought in as head coaches that don't have a lot of NHL experience, they might in other leagues, but when I look at guys like uh, Don Hay, Greg Gilbert, Jim Playfair... Glenn Gulletson, like we just we don't have a good track record of picking the right guys outside of the NHL. Yeah, and well, part of that is that like the Flames team, frankly, like in the early two thousands, the Flames were crap. So you know, you having anybody as your coach, hey, who cares? Like you could have Scotty Bowman as your coach, the team is still going to be crap. <laughs> you know, but. It's different, though, like, more recently, like, Glenn Gulletson, that was not the right coach for that job at the time, and, you know, like... Nice guy, of all good the, hair, I don't think a good head coach. No, I... In terms of, like, relative results based on the caliber of team that he inherited, I think that he was the worst coach in Flames history, but... You know, and, like, you you move back, like, when we had Brent Sutter, great junior coach, no success in the NHL. Playfair, no success in the NHL. Still hasn't had a head coaching job since. It, Mike Keenan was at the very end of his career and didn't really care, it seems. Like, it, it he didn't seem to be as, like, Iron Mike. It was more Aluminum Mike. And, you know... It, it just seems like this team, like, the Flames are in a different situation now than basically since the early 90s, where this team should win based on the amount of players that are good in the organization and all that. Like, the Flames should be one of the top two teams or three teams in the West, and one of the top five or six teams in the NHL, just based on raw talent alone and like for since like 91 the flames haven't really had that and i think that like it's okay to have different coaches that are just there type of thing when your team doesn't really have any upper end expectations of oh hey we're going to go and win the cup now or vie for it this team is in a situation where they are a credible team if they're playing correctly, and yet their coaching has not been indicative of that. And it's frustrating because this team, I think in order to take that next level, you need to have one of those good coaches in your organization. And, like, you look at Washington, they kind of... They had some decent coaches, but not a great one. And they brought in a very established Barry Trotz, and they ended up winning the Stanley Cup. And it's one of those where I think that... 
I don't know that you look at Gallant, though, and say you've got a really experienced Angel coach. No, but he's good. And, like, he... The Florida Panthers, when he was there that first season, they were not a good organization. And yet he got them to their best record, I do believe, either in their franchise history or close to it, and finally made the playoffs. Then the next year they struggle for a little bit and they fire him. And then he brings Vegas, an expansion team, into the Stanley Cup Finals. And, you know, if not for a collapse in Game 7, they probably would have went to the Conference Finals again last year. That's, I think, the thing that we have to look at for Gallant is what he was able to do with an expansion Vegas team. Yeah, and, like, that's why I think he's one of the top five coaches in the league. Because, like, he got a lot out of that Florida Panthers team. And he got a lot out of that Vegas team. And even Laviolette, like, he brought the Flyers to the finals back in 2009. And then Nashville as an eighth seed to the finals that one year, a couple years ago. And, like, I don't like Laviolette as much as Gallant. But either one of those guys knows how to get to the Stanley Cup finals. They've been there. When, like, other than Daryl Sutter, who got there with us, when is the last time, like, Mike Keenan was at the end of his career? Like, none of the Flames coaches had any protracted playoff success, and Mike Keenan was only good that one year when the Rangers won the Cup, and he kind of messed a lot of other teams up. For me, I think I'd go... If you want to hire someone mid-season, I would go Gallant. I'm not. Yeah, same here. I, I know where you're going with the with um, Laviolette, but I think I would either go right now Gallant or keep Ward and take your chances a better guy comes available in the off season. Yeah. Well, that uh, to me, like, I'd be rolling out the welcome wagon for Gallant uh, more so than Laviolette. Yeah, but, like if, if Laviolette's still available in July and no one's picked him up, a you'll, he's you'll probably get a better deal on him then too. But I I think somebody will pick him up, which means someone else will probably hire fire their coach. And I think that there's other coaches that could be made available that are better than him. Yeah. So yeah, I I'd totally be willing to pursue Gallant either now or even if they talk to him now and he says, you know what, I just want to stay at home and do nothing. But they sort of have a, an agreement that he'll come in in July. Yeah, something. It just, that seems to be like the one area that the Flames have kind of cheaped out in to an extent over... Well, and I don't like even know their... if it's cheaping out, but I wonder sometimes if the best coaches want to come here. Like, this isn't a team with a track record of success. I sometimes think that you get the coach you deserve. And I think, honestly, the Flames have, for the most part, had the coaches they deserved. Yeah, I can agree with you there. You know, Toronto was a bit of an anomaly with Babcock because it's Toronto, but, you know, look at a lot of teams. Look at Vancouver. Look at other teams that haven't been, you know, very successful franchises, and I'd say they have similar coaching track records to Calgary. Yeah, true enough. So, you know, I, I think that it's hard to say, hey, top coach in the league, you should come here and help us win, and they're going to say, well, why would I come there when I could go somewhere else who might have better success? True. And that'd be my thing with Laviolette. I, I wonder if Peter might think that he's better than the Flames. Yeah. Well, the guys who aren't better than the Flames, actually, I guess the best Flames, are the three Flames going to the All-Star game this year. And that's Matthew Kachuk, Mark Giordano, David Riddick. David Riddick's an injury replacement in net. Um, the We know the All-Star game is in St. Louis this year. Matt, you and I were talking before we recorded. I can't remember the last time I watched an All-Star game. Well, in its entirety, I think for me it was like 97. I remember watching part of the John Scott year, uh, that whenever that one was. Oh yeah, I remember um, that whole thing. But uh, I watched part of that game, but yeah, most times it's like, yeah, who cares? Like, th- I know I checked like the scoreboard after the game to see, like, did any Flames get any points? Then, oh, neat, okay, who cares? You know, the NFL does their Pro Bowl at the end of the season, right before the Super Bowl, and I think they do it in Hawaii or something. 
Yeah. What if the NHL, like, I don't know, maybe it's just because it's another NHL thing and another NHL city. We know this team likes to go overseas. We've seen the Flames play in China. We've seen games in Finland. What would you think if they took the whole three-on-three thing overseas, either this time of year or even at the end of the year, and said, let's pick a host city every year and bring the best in the league to, to you know, Helsinki or wherever they want to go? That'd be interesting. Doing it this time of year, you'd need to give everyone a buy at the same time so they get over there, get back, and not be jet lagged. But if it happened right, you know, after the season or even after the playoffs, I think it could be a neat way to to cap off the year. Yeah, it'd be interesting. That that would be something very different. To from... me, that that seems better than let's start the season over in Helsinki and then come back two days later and have to be ready. You're like the Flames when they went to China and then played, what, three days later in North America. Yeah. Like, I think that might give it some credence if it almost becomes like a, a World Series. Yeah. Um, and you could even get back to... Oh, the... speaking of the World Series... Have you heard about that Astros thing? What Astros thing? Oh, uh, they, they apparently were cheating so much and, like, stealing all the signs and that that the other team was using and, uh, like, were digitally relaying, uh, like, what pitch was coming to the batters and all that. And the Astros, uh, they ended up actually winning the World Series, like, in 2017 and... Uh, were in the World Series this past year, and like it's just a huge cheating scandal. I didn't know. I tend not to follow baseball. Yeah, no, that's yeah. It's a bit of a gong show. It puts kind of like the whole reputation of the entire sport on, and like uh, the Astros got fined uh, two first and two second round picks, and their general manager and coach got fired, and that was it. And it's like, um, yeah, okay. Just a weird thing. Can I go back to hockey now? Sure. Um, so, World Series. The last time that I think the All-Star game... I, I don't care who's the best in the Pacific Division or in the, you know, whatever division, the Metropolis Division. I really don't care about divisional rivalries. I My favorite format they've done a while was North America versus the world and I think it'd be neat to go overseas and sort of reenact that even if it was the home country versus if they want to do three on three let's say they're in Russia it would be like the world cup where it's like Canada versus Russia versus Sweden but still do it as sort of the three on three yeah yeah uh, there definitely be some interesting ways of going about it like in that like you could kind of have like the four team thing like team north america team europe the russian nhlers and like the khl all-stars each having like their own team and going against each other yeah i don't think you get other leagues going that's gonna be that's gonna be i mean if you want to do that what i would do is just take the uh the stanley cup team and play them against somebody else but I, I think even if it's not, you know, other leagues, if it's, let's say, Russia's the host, it's even the Russians versus everybody else. Like, the best Russians versus everybody else. Yeah. So, team I just... Team everybody else wins 17-3. Well, to three. You know, Team World, <laughs> right? Like, isn't that what they yeah. used to do? North America versus the world? Yeah. I guess I've just stopped caring, and I'm looking for a reason to care. The other thing I don't care about is this year's jerseys. They're so awful. Yeah. Well, like, uh, before the show, we were talking about that, and, like, my suggestion would have been having, like, because it's supposed to be, like, musical notes on the the background, and, like, that's what those lines are. It's supposed to be, like, a musical sheet. And, like, I was thinking that, like, if you made, like, each of the division logos on the jersey, but, like, enhance the size of the team that that player actually plays for that would have been a better concept than what they ended up getting. But, yeah, it the whole jersey kind of sucks. You know, the white ones, the more I look at them, and I've been looking at them while you are talking about this Astros thing, they look like, uh, do you remember as a kid that full scap paper you had in your binder in school? Yeah. That's what they look like to me. Like, they, they don't look like musical staffs. It just, it looks like grid paper or lined yeah. paper. I know it's. I also don't really like the 
team logo on the front. Like I, I kind of liked it when there was an All Star logo. It made it special in a way. Yeah. Well, frankly, like you'd have to go all the way back. Well, even the NHL logo is something different. Yeah, like I would think like all the way back into the like 1980s and 1990s when the All-Star game jerseys were actually interesting. My favorite ones were the 94, 95 ones or 94 to 97 when they actually looked like a star, remember and it was like the yeah. the yellow and the the purple yeah, stars. Yeah, like the Dallas Stars uh template. Yeah. But and then after that was uh, 98, 99, when they sort of had these, like, vertical... It was the first vertical lines in the jersey, which I liked. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. It's, uh... I, I, yeah. I don't want to spend know, a lot like, of time talking about them, but they it, the whole thing is just kind of silly to me. Yeah. Like, I, re- I like the orange and black ones from the 80s, um... Like uh, like eighty eight and through ninety one, like those were interesting, but yeah, like it's like a lot of the jerseys lately. It's just been very bland or just plain ugly. <laughs> yeah, I'm flipping through the list here on NHLJerseys dot com, and I, I sort of I get they're wanting to incorporate something from the sort of the host team member last year in San Jose, it was, what was it? They were made of recycled bottles or something. Yeah. But it's like, you know what? It's it's an all-star jersey, and I don't know how much revenue you make from it anyways. Like, based on that, if we ever had the all-star game again, I'd hate to see what we'd have. Everyone would have team-colored flames coming off the bottom or something. Yeah. Or the saddle dome shape for the, stri- I don't know, for the stripes. Yeah, like, just bad all the way around. Yeah, like, I'm going through that same list, and, like, a lot of the jerseys are just awful. (laughs) Call me, maybe it's just because I grew up on the old-school NHL uh, All-Star uniforms, but I want the All-Star uniform to have stars on it. Yeah. Or the big star, like the ones in, you know, 94, 95. Yeah. Yeah. Something or there's some years like those uh, 99 ones where and even the world versus uh, North America I didn't like them but they were different like try something different lead the league in a, in a funky uniform yeah I didn't uh, mind the 2006 ones um, the sort of gray black and yellow but since then I just I I haven't been a fan yeah. I like the 2004 retro ones just because it fit with Minnesota. But, yeah, like, a lot of them just are awful. Yeah. And, but, I, you know, it is what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm I just – I don't really care about the All-Star game. So, congrats to the three guys that are going. Um, if you're yeah, a first fa- time that the Flames have had three since, uh, I do believe, 91-92 – with uh, Flurry McInnes and Roberts. It tells you we're not that bad a team this year. Yeah. Just everybody else in our division is horrible, and they needed somebody. So no. I'm, I'm uh. curious. If you watch the All-Star game, if there's like a tradition you have, tweet us. Uh, we're at Fireside Podcast. Come on Facebook, facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. Send us an email, whatever you want to do. But let us know what it is you get out of the All-Star game. Like I don't want to make fun of you or anything. I legitimately want to hear... What's your interest in the All-Star game? Because for me, I lost interest a few years ago, and I'm curious what the draw is. I think it would be a lot of fun to go if it was live in your city. I would probably definitely go if it was in Calgary because the whole weekend of festivities sound fun. But I don't know, just sitting and watching the All-Star game on TV, the guys don't seem to want to be there halftime or just want to have fun. Like, Let us know what it is you like about it. I'd be curious to know. Yeah, like that. Uh- to me like it, i'd be there if it was in calgary or even in edmonton or something like that where it's close because hey that's interesting but yeah like to just watch it like most of the players don't care it doesn't have any significant impact like at least with baseball like the all-star whoever wins the all-star game hosts the world series like that it has home field in the world series so that at least has some stakes to it. Like, there's not really anything at well, there, all. There's still cash, isn't there? Like, I know the John Scott year, they won some cash if they won. Yeah, I don't know. 
I can't remember off the top of my head. We should probably know this, Matt. We should, but, you know, it shows how much we don't care about the All-Star game. Well, I think we've uh, we've been going just over an hour now. I think it's probably time to wrap it up. We have no predictions to make because the Flames don't play for the next week. And as such, next week's show is going to be a boring episode if you guys don't help us out. So we want everybody to call in. Let us know what you think the Flames should do at the deadline. Should they sell everything that's not bolted down to a multi-year contract or more? Um, do you watch the All-Star game? What are your favorite memories in the last 40 years? Let us know. We want to put your content on the show. If you want to, us to hear your voice, you can phone us, leave a voicemail, or text us at 587-200-7176. Again, 587-200-7176. Leave us a voicemail or a text. We'd be happy to put your content on the show. You can tweet us. You can find us on Facebook and leave your message, but... We want you guys to participate. Tell us what you think of the team this year, what they should do going forward, or give us your favorite memory of the last 40 years of this team because it's probably a better season than this one. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever your memory is, probably gave them a better season yeah, than this one. Yeah, and if there's anything really that you want to chat with us about, drop us a line because it'll make things more interesting. I'm going to try and get... I don't want to promise anything yet, but I'm going to try and get something, somebody special to come chat with us next week. But we also need you, or Matt and I are going to be sitting here for an hour talking about the All-Star game we don't care about. Yes, which that's exciting. Maybe we'll look up the very, KHL All-Star game and talk exciting. about that one too. Oh, well, speaking of which, the goalie took a face-off in the KHL All-Star game and for some reason lost the face-off and then got scored on immediately. Yeah, that was the thing that happened. So, yes. Classic. We got to talk about that then. Yes. Woo. Well, Matt, neither of us won the prediction game last week. I thought we'd win two. You thought we'd lose two. Uh, we split them. Split the difference, yeah. So, so we're we're not even... We're like the Flames. We're not going into the bye week with a very good record. Nope. Hopefully, the Flames get a little... You know, come out of the gate strong, but... You know, their first game is against the best team in the West and then the Edmonton Oilers, so it'll be interesting to see exactly what the Flames do, but yeah. What are you going to do with all your time off this week? Uh, work. Yay. I get to do a little bit of organizing and that kind of stuff when I'm not working. See how boring so. Matt is when there's no hockey? We need hockey from to watch. Yeah, like I... I'll get you a one-week subscription to the ECHL website. Oh, goody. Yeah. Or the SPHL. <laughs> you can watch their stuff live-streamed. It looks like it's on somebody's phone. Awesome. Or if you want to, come over to Satan and watch the Trojans play. There's some hockey you can watch live. Can I take a nap now? <laughs> okay, I'll let you go take a nap. Uh, we're out of here. We'll talk to everyone next week. Matt, do you want to take us out as usual? As always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.